on the Seder night, we do something crazy, insane, makes no sense. Nobody would stand for such a thing. Only the Jews would put up with this kind of craziness. Or maybe we never gave it much consideration. Let's stop and think for a minute. Let's say you go into your favorite delicatessen. You go into Markey's, Aleva Shalom, on Wilson Avenue. Remember, this is just a theoretical conversation. Or when you're in Montreal, you go to your favorite smoked meat deli. Or in New York, you go to the Second Avenue or Wachenheimer's. You sit down, they bring you a menu, but you already know what you want. Corned beef or smoked meat or Romanian pastrami, whatever your favorite is. Rye bread, Russian dressing, coleslaw, half-sour pickle, a diet Dr. Brown's black cherry soda has to be diet. They write down your order, they bring you your drink, your mouth is watering with anticipation. They bring you out a plate with fresh rye bread, mustard, pickle, coleslaw, dressing, no meat, not a slice, not a shred. You say, thank you, and you dig right in. Who among us has that kind of strength, that kind of fortitude? We would shout, we would make such a scene, what is this? You bring me a sandwich with no meat? What do you think I came here for? What kind of operation is this? I'm sure it would be much worse. I'm soft peddling the language here in case there are families watching with children. We would not be happy. We would not take no meat for an answer. We'd be outraged if we were served our sandwich with no meat on it. And yet, what are we going to do this Wednesday night? After we tell the story of the exodus from Egypt, Yetzias Mitzrayim, after the second cup of wine, after mozi, matzah, and moror, with a f probably more than a few rachzas in there, no doubt a few extra hand washings every 20 minutes, whether you need it or not. We're going to take matzah and moror, we're going to take unleavened bread and bitter herb, and make a sandwich, and say, Cain asa Hillel, this is what Hillel used to do. This is what Hillel used to do when the temple was standing. He used to roll matzah and bitter herb together with the meat of the Pesach and eat them together to fulfill the verse in the book of Numbers, they shall eat it with matzah and bitter herbs. And we're going to eat the matzah and the moror with no meat on the sandwich at all and pretend we enjoy it. My friends, we will be eating a delicious pastrami sandwich, if you can consider it delicious, minus the meat. Crazy. But that's what's going to happen. Bread and condiments with no meat. Some sandwich that's going to be. But here's the thing. It accustoms us to be able to embrace the imperfect, the abnormal, the strange, the unexpected. When you eat your Hillel sandwich with no meat anywhere in sight, it exercises your sense of imagination. That's what we're doing at the Seder. We're giving our imagination a workout. One attitude when the temple ended 1,950 years ago could have been for us to say, well, let's just pack it in. That's it. Game over. If there's no temple in Jerusalem, then there's no Judaism. If a guy can't sacrifice his lamb and eat it for Passover, what kind of Jew is he? What kind of Judaism is that? Count me out. That would have been one option, one attitude. The other attitude, the one that we adopted is, let's eat the matzah and the horseradish, even though we don't have the meat in the sandwich, which, to use a metaphor, is really the meat in the sandwich. Let's do the best that we can under the circumstances. Let's at least remember, let's at least tell the story so we won't forget, so we'll know what it is that we're missing. Here's a story that I love hearing about this most Jewish of attitudes. They tell the story about Yitzhak Perlman, who was once reciting, playing a, a, a concert in a recital hall, a packed concert hall. In the middle of the concert, there was a loud crack. One of the strings on his violin suddenly snapped. Now he was left with three strings instead of four. What did he do? He kept right on playing, recomposing the music in his head as he went along to be able to play a four-stringed violin concerto 
on three strings. It was a most stunning performance, and at the end, to thunderous applause and multiple ovations, Perlman quieted the crowd. And he said to them simply, sometimes the task of the artist is to see how much music you can make with what you have left. Sometimes the task of the artist is to see how much music you can make with what you have left. This most moving story is really a summary of what we do with our lives as Jews. For much of the last 50 years, maybe even more, the world has been more or less favorably disposed to us. For the last 30 years since communism crumbled in Russia and Israel continued to strengthen itself, it's been pretty good to be Jewish. No one told us what we can't do. No one really restricted us from learning, doing, being Jewish. Now all of a sudden there's a great restriction placed on us, not by the KGB, not by the Nazis, but by some stinking respiratory virus that none of us ever heard of last Hanukkah time. And because of that, we can't get together to daven on Shabbos and Yom Tif. We can't invite our friends and relatives over for the Seder. Even some parents and children are forced to remain apart, when of course there's nothing that they would love more and expect more than to be together for the Seder. So let's take a page of inspiration from the Yitzchak Perlman story and see how much music we can make from what we have left. Let's take a page or a leaf of inspiration from the Korech, from Hillel's sandwich, and see how much Seder we can make from what we have. No meat, just some dry matzah and some horseradish, some romaine lettuce, no guests, just ourselves. This year people are saying, why can't we have everybody together? Or at least, very least, have a Seder by internet. Why can't we be together virtually? So here's a suggestion for that. Spend as much time as you possibly can after Shabbos, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, even Wednesday. Spend all day Wednesday on Zoom, on the phone, on Skype, whatever platform you use to be in touch with your loved ones. If you want to make a Seder for the kids Wednesday afternoon, let's say from 4 to 6, then do it by all means. Bobby will love seeing it on Zoom. But because of health concerns, we are not going to get together for the Seder with the extended family, with anyone who doesn't live in our house. Because we understand that it's a risk to their health, to our health, to the health of others. So we're not going to do it. We're also not going to Zoom on Yom Tif, and here's why. We are fast becoming digital slaves. If you don't believe me, try this simple experiment. On Monday, promise yourself when you wake up, you're not going to check any media, no newspapers online, no email, no Facebook feed, no Zoom, no WhatsApp, nothing. No internet at all. See how long it takes you in the day to start getting jittery and shaky, anxious. You'll need a fix. You're going to go through withdrawal. We depend so much, so heavily, on our devices and our screens to occupy our time, make our connections, fill our heads. We're becoming servants to the screens, not the other way around. So Baruch Hashem, comes Shabbos, comes Yom Tif, Yom Kippur, Pesach, Shavuos, whatever it is, we say, okay, no email today, no WhatsApp today, I'm just going to talk to the people who are around me. I'm just going to be me. Not virtual me, but actual me. Well, our digital virtual media smartphone is not so happy with that compromise. So it waited patiently until it found an opening. Aha! An emergency! Now everyone's going to want to use me on Yom Tif, and it's for a good cause, to be together with family. What could be more important than that? Please, let's not let ourselves be fooled. It's not an emergency. It's not life or death. This is not an emergency where they come and they tell us we have three days to leave Anatevka. That's an emergency. And even then, not something we can handle. So use Zoom and phone and Skype and WhatsApp all you possibly can right up until Yom Tif. Then when it comes time to light the candles, Wednesday night, 7.35, light your candles, sit down with whoever's in the house and make the Seder. Even if it's just you, you get a chance to use your imagination. There were stories going around the net this week of great rabbis who made the Seder all by themselves, alone, even though people offered to keep them company, even though people invited them over. They made the Seder all by themselves, 
perhaps to show that not only is it perfectly all right, perfectly kosher, to make the Seder all by yourself, it's holy, it's powerful, it's real. Not virtual, it's the real thing. This year, this special night is going to be different than all the other nights. And different usually doesn't mean worse. Usually it means better. So let's make it that way this year. Let's let this night be different. Let's make it special and holy and memorable for the very best. Now back to our sandwich. Back to our Hillel sandwich. It's called korech, which really means rolled up. We use matzahs nowadays that are baked to a crisp and beyond to make sure they're baked all the way through. In Hillel's time, it seems the matzahs were softer, so they could actually be rolled around the roasted meat and the bitter herb of the Passover sacrifice and eaten that way. Sounds to me like a shawarma lafa wrap with horseradish, which actually sounds pretty good if you think about it. So here's what happened, it seems. The Torah says it's a mitzvah on Passover to eat unleavened bread, eat matzah. The Torah says it's a mitzvah on Passover to eat bitter herbs, maror to remember how unpleasant and bitter-tasting slavery and captivity is. And of course, since it's a holiday, the Torah says it's a mitzvah to enjoy the roasted meat of a Paschal or Passover offering, a carbon Pesach. So if each one of those is a mitzvah, probably each one should have a bracha, a blessing of its own. Now Hillel said, hey, what if we take each of those and eat all three together, like it says in the book of Numbers in Bamidbar. So he rolled them up together, made a bracha, and enjoyed geschmack, delicious. Now in our times, they still bake matzah. They still sell horseradish and romaine lettuce. But the problem is, since there's no temple, we can't prepare and enjoy or share any offering. So no korban pesach, no meat. Great for the vegetarians, but what about the rest of us? We have to make do without. So we're back to that question, do we forget the whole thing? Or do we do the best we can with what we got? Our answer, of course, is we do the best with what we've got. Welcome to the Pesach Seder. Welcome to the Korach, the amazing Hillel meatless memory sandwich. The late Rabbi Malevsky, Rabbi Uziel Malevsky, who taught in Toronto for many years, as well as Mexico and Yerushalayim, <coughs> writes in great depth about this idea of Zecher Lemikdash, remembrance of the temple, in the context of, uh, of the Korech. He writes that Hillel's contemporaries objected to eating the meat of the Pesach together with matzah and marah because they felt that the taste of each item should remain distinct. He writes, uh, Rabbi Malevsky writes, that just as eating matzah with mayonnaise, which happens to be my favorite vegetable, is not really fulfilling the mitzvah because if you have another flavor, you're not tasting the main thing. Hillel said, you're right, in principle, but this is not a condiment. Each taste, the Pesach, the Matzah, and the Maror, each taste itself is a mitzvah. So when you have all three mitzvahs, Matzah, Maror, Pesach together, you can have them all together, and they complement. They don't detract one from another. Then Rabbi Malevsky wonders if Hillel himself would eat the Hillel sandwich, the Korach that we eat today, with no Pesach only and Marar only a rabbinic mitzvah as a memory of the temple. From there he asks, since we're on the subject, why is it that Marar is considered to be here a rabbinic mitzvah, not a Torah mitzvah? So he explains, interesting, what happened over time, over decades, over centuries, millennia of exile. Just like happened in Egypt, we got used to slavery and subjugation. We got used to it. Not so bad slavery. You get a roof over your head, three squares a day, and our present exile, we're all in exile, all the Jewish people, wherever we live, even in Israel. Not so popular to say that. Uh, as long as the nation is unredeemed, the world is unredeemed, we're all still in exile. That's what exile is. But you know, not so bad. In fact, it's rather comfortable. Cable, I got internet, takeout. Quite comfortable, actually, till this pandemic scare kicked in. But Rambel Malevsky says, it's a shortcoming. It doesn't reflect well on us that we're not bitter about it. We've lost our perception of suffering, our resenting, our bitterness towards exile. We say, as people say, it is what it is. True enough, but what is it? It's bitter. That's what it is, and we've forgotten that. We lost sight of that. So maror, the food that reminds us of how bitter things are, is no longer a Torah commandment. Now it's a rabbinic commandment, which in a way makes things clearer, because now it's a zecher. It's a remembrance. We have to remind ourselves what bitter is. 
and remember it and make it part of our perception that things are not that th the things as they are are not things as they could be but it also makes things a little more complicated technically speaking because now matzah and maror don't go together the way they once did they're no longer both torah commandments one is a torah commandment one's rabbinic as a remembrance because we're not eating it with the korban pesach the way it's supposed to be so how does that affect everything the majority of the sages feel that each menu item here is a separate thing, which each gets its own separate bracha. We eat the matzah, and we say hamotzi and alachilas matzah, two brachas in fact. And after that, we eat some maror, which is a remembrance of the temple times and the paschal sacrifice. So we eat the maror with its own bracha, alachilas maror. By the way, the Rambam says if you eat matzah and maror like Hillel did, then the bracha is alachilas matzah umrorim, a little bit different than what we have in our Haggadah. And as an aside, you remember, we dip the whole thing in charosis, right? Which is also a remembrance. Remembrance of the mortar that we joined the bricks together with when we were building in uh, Egypt. So you have a good question. Why don't we make a barach on charosis also? Another time we'll talk about that. But now, in our times, we do as Hillel did. We combine them. We first eat them separately to fulfill the opinion of the sages. Then we eat them together. Hillel felt that the maror, and the matzah, and the meat of the sacrifice should be eaten together, and that's what he did, so that's what we do too. One reason is that he appreciated that if matzah indicates freedom, and maror indicates the bitterness of slavery, <clears throat> it takes the two of them together to make us appreciate fully what we have, and what we are, and how our experience becomes part of that. Rav Kook the first Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Palestine writes that Hillel would eat the matzah and maror separately and then together to fulfill both opinions like we do. And he explains that the symbolism is that you could understand that there's a divine reason why we have to suffer and that God redeems us from Egypt and continues to save us throughout history. We need to eat maror and matzah both. However, we're at risk. We might see these as two totally separate things. Sometimes we suffer for a reason. Sometimes we're saved for a reason. So Hillel is teaching us that in order to truly understand the suffering, we need to fuse it together with the freedom. The limitation of slavery and the expanse of redemption are part of the same continuum, two points of the process. So Hillel ate the matzah together with the maror to show that they can only be understood and accepted fully and internalized when you eat them together. He goes deeper, Rav Kook says that it's important to understand that the two aspects of life, freedom and servitude, symbolized by matzah and maror, are not independent from one another. They actually interact. They actually complement one another. The highest freedom is attained only when it's crowned with the sublime servitude, which is, of course, service of the melech hakavod, the king of honor, hakadosh baruch Hu. That is complete freedom. Ultimate freedom comes sandwiched with servitude. This is when a person finds in their soul the complete mastery of a truly free person who rules over the greatest of powers, his own power of freedom itself. He says it's no coincidence that the exclusive remembrance of the temple in the entire Seder is according to Hillel's view. Hillel, remember, is the one who says in Pirkei Avos, after Pesach, we're going to start learning Pirkei Avos, Shabbos afternoons. And there Hillel is quoted as saying, be like the disciples of Aharon, Love peace and pursue peace. Love humankind and bring them to Torah. It's this approach of Hillel, the peacemaker, that will bring about the restoration of the Holy Temple, says Rav Kook. The al Sheikh HaKodesh sees the Yetzer HaTov symbolized in the Matzah and Maror indicating Yetzer Hara. He says the reason we wrap them together and eat them together is to fulfill true Avodas Hashem, true divine service. When in Shema we read, with all your hearts, it's in the plural, this means with both your inclinations. You have to serve God with your positive inclination and also with your Yetzir Hara. Rav Ramon from Gush works with this idea too, saying that freedom is important, but freedom can be a gift or a curse. One has to know how to live as a free person. One who's free of all constraints and can do whatever he wants. That's not truly free. A free person is one who can do whatever he wants to, but does only that 
which his pure soul, his neshama, instructs him to do. A free person is one who knows how to control his freedom. There's terrible slavery, but there's also uplifting slavery, which is using your strength to advance your soul. Slavery by itself is terrible. That's why we do not lean when we eat the maror by itself. However, when slavery is joined together with the characteristics of freedom, when it complements a person's freedom, it's elevated. And that's why we lean like free people for eating the korech, the sandwich. This is the path of true freedom. Freedom governed by self-control is uplifting servitude. Rabbi Soloveitchik has this to say about the meaning of korech, the Hillel sandwich. He says the experience of Egyptian servitude underlies the very morality of the Jew. The fact that in Egypt the Jews were exposed to all kinds of chicanery and humiliation engendered in the Jewish people sensitivity and tenderness towards their fellow man. Without the experience of slavery, we would have remained unexposed to suffering, emotionally vulgar and insensitive. Thus, only in Egypt could the Jews have become an Am and a Goy Gadol, a, pe a, na a people and a great nation. Not sure Rabbi Soloveitchik would appreciate me sprinkling in a little gematria to underscore his point, but the Pe'er Aharon on the Haggadah notes that the gematria of Mororim and Malchus is the same, that bitterness and sovereignty, kingship, share a common origin. Rabbi Ephraim Nissenbaum wrote, writes that uh, the Targum Unculus, the Aramaic translation of the, of the Torah, translates the word Pesach as chas. We usually translate it skipping over, but here it says chas, which means compassion, in contrast to the way we usually translate it, pass over. Right? He says that the Bnei Yisrael perhaps did not thoroughly deserve God's compassion at the time of going out of Egypt, but nevertheless, he took us out. And he says this was on two accounts. One, he had compassion for the terrible persecution that we suffered, and two, that we later showed great trust and devotion by following God into the desert, not knowing where we were going, not knowing what we would eat. God knew beforehand that we had this faith so he made us worthy of redemption from Egypt. So the Hillel sandwich has to be matzah and maror together because the Paschal sacrifice has to be eaten with the foods that represent the source of God's compassion, the matzah, which is the faith that we later showed, and the maror, the bitter suffering of slavery. By the way, in that same vein, Beis Avram, Beis Aaron, another commentary on the Haggadah, notes that we have to make a sandwich, one on top of the other, with uh, the maror in between, because one piece of matzah recalls the matzah in the korech, and the other piece of matzah rec recalls the meat of the Pesach itself. Then you have the mora, now you have all the elements. Told us Yaakov Yosef, disciple of the Baal Shem Tev, explains that matzah represents tzaddikim, who have no trace of Yetzir Hara, and maror, which in gematria is also mavis, death, that refers to the wicked, whom the gemara refers to as if not living. Since Hillel was the epitome of kindness, he would wrap the two together and eat them together. He would instruct the righteous to maintain contact with the wicked and draw them close to Torah. Thus they would develop contact with the Aleph, the Aluf or Shal Olam, the oneness of God, and add to that mace, death, Aleph plus mace equals emes, truth. Sfas Emes writes that eating matzah and marah together expresses our conviction that God's running the world is the same, both in times of exile and in times of redemption. Also, in truth, everything Hashem does in the world, whether it seems sweet or bitter to us, is directed towards the same goal. So every day in davening we say, Melech memis umachaya umatmiach Yeshua, the King who causes death and restores life and makes salvation sprout. We affirm that life, death, and resurrection are all essential links in one chain that leads to Geula, leads to redemption. As long as we're in exile, it is for us the opposite of life, and only redemption will bring us true life, Chayim Amiti. Combining the Matzah and the Mora together expresses our belief in the total unity of God's plan for the world. And for this night, at least, it sweetens the bitterness of exile. Dr. Erica Brown came out with a conversational Haggadah a few years back titled Seder Talk. 
There's some insight into each point, and then she offers you a question to discuss at the table. Her explanation of Korech first asks what exactly the Hillel sandwich is meant to be. Is it a memory sandwich of the Exodus night, or is it a scrap of matzah and herbs to recall the destroyed temple? When the temple stood still, people could make the exact sandwich that the Bnei Yisrael once would have eaten on the very first Passover, and that's what Hillel did. Here we are, all, here we're also recalling not only the first time this was done, but the way we were able to relive this event with greater precision when the temple existed. It's as if part of our very memory is impaired or compromised so that we mourn not only the loss of the temple, but the subsequent losses caused by its loss, like the failure to reenact the story through a ritual that's missing its key ingredient. The question Dr. Brown puts out there for us to discuss is this. What do you find gets in the way, what do you find in your life gets in the way of memory making? More specifically, think of a powerful food or taste memory. Is there an ingredient missing that you can't easily obtain now? That's something to think about at your Seder. Finally, listen to this story about the Divrei Chaim, the famous Rav Chaim of Sanz, who lived in Poland in the 1800s. Once upon a time, a Jew from another shtetl called Dinov traveled to the famous doctors in Vienna for medical advice because he was suffering from a life-threatening respiratory disease. The doctors told him that his disease could not be treated, certainly not cured, because his lung was not in the normal position. It was pushed to one side and filled with material which could not be drained and was going to cause decay. They gave him no hope. They suggested that he hurry home so as not to die among strangers. The man started home heartbroken. On his way, he passed through Sanz, and he thought he would stop in and ask the great Rav Chaim of Sanz what to do about the Seder. I can't eat the proper amount of maror, so should I eat a little and not make a bracha? Or should I make the bracha on a little bit of maror? What should I do? The Sanz of Rav listened carefully to his question and answered, he said, it is said that maror is a food of healing. You should be able to eat the proper amount of maror and be healed. After the Jew left and continued on his way home, he remembered that in the Zohar it says, not that maror is a healing food, but that matzah is a healing food. Sanzarav had obviously made a mistake. So he pushed the thought out of his mind and pressed on, trying to get home before Yom Tif. On the night of the Seder, at the time for eating maror, this sick man took just a tiny amount of the bitter herb, and immediately he began to cough violently, weakening himself greatly, racking his body with coughs. At that moment, he thought his time was finished on earth, so he said to himself, let me at least die, fulfilling a mitzvah properly. He took the full portion of proper kezayas of maror, made the bracha, and ate it. No sooner had he swallowed it, then the cough overtook him and shook his whole body terribly. His family ran to get the village doctor, who was himself sitting by the Seder and didn't exactly want to come running. When he did arrive, he found that the patient was asleep. The family told him that the man exhausted himself completely from coughing and went to bed, fell asleep on the bed. The doctor said that sleep was good for him. They shouldn't wake him. The man slept until late the next day, and when the doctor came to examine him, he found that the man was much better. The force of the cough and the shuddering of the body had jarred the lung back into its normal position and was able to drain itself, clear itself out. The maror had been, as the Sanzarav blessed him, a food of healing. Now this story is not practical halacha or practical medical advice either. No one should be traveling to Vienna. No one should be going further than Vaughan to be real about it. And no one should give up either, even when others give up on us. And remember this, what did this Jew say? Well, I might as well do the best I can under the circumstances. And it worked out. It seemed impossible. It seemed hopeless. It seemed futile. It seemed illogical. But he said, let me do the mitzvah the best I possibly can. That vision should be our vision this year at the Seder. The Hillel sandwich that delicious meat sandwich without the meat, that's our banner, that's our rallying point. 
We don't have the things the way we want. We don't have Babi and Zaidi at the Seder. We don't have a carbon Pesach. We don't have the family together. We don't have a temple in Yerushalayim. We don't even have our freedom. We could go on and on about all the things we don't have, but that is exactly what Pesach is not about. We acknowledge what we do have and we're thankful for it. Dayenu, we say. And we look forward to even better times. We say in the very beginning of the Haggadah, now we're slaves, next year let's be free. Now we're here, next year let's be in Yerushalayim. This year we're without a lot of the things we want, maybe even a few things that we need. Too bad, Selavi, Azoyedas. We're going ahead with it anyway. Those who have to make the Seder alone, make the Seder alone, it's going to be good. Those who can make the Seder with a few others, make the Seder with a few others, it'll be good too. We're going to reach deep into the wellsprings of our Jewish imagination. We're going to imagine ourselves sitting around B'nai Brak with Rabbi Tarfon, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, discussing the Seder all night until sunup. We'll imagine ourselves at the Seder table with our Zaydis, only this time we get to do all the talking. We'll imagine ourselves in a world truly liberated from sickness and strife and sadness and sorrow and liberated even from death and from loss. We'll make the Korach this year, as it says in, in the Haggadah, we'll wrap together the taste of freedom and the misery of slavery together and we'll realize how much the bitterness of one helps us appreciate the sweetness of the other. We'll sit at the Seder table as slaves to the quarantine, but we look forward very soon to being free and healthy and happy and safe. May it soon be true for all of us in our precious kahila, for the whole world, and may we all enjoy a happy and healthy and kosher Pesach. Good Shabbos, good Yamtif.